one of the key techniques in a chemistry lab is preparing solutions. The compounds that you work with in the chemistry course and in a chemistry lab in their pure form are solids. Copper sulfate, cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate. These are solid materials that when mixed together won't really do a whole lot, mixing the two solid compounds together. You're not looking at the reactions of these individual whole solid ionic compounds. You're looking at the reaction of the individual ions. And to obtain those ions, the solid chemicals need to dissolve in a solvent, usually water. When you have a mass of a material, you can use its molecular weight to determine how many moles of material you have, and that can be dissolved in a specific volume. The ratio of moles per volume, per moles per liter of the final solution is the chemistry concentration unit of molarity. In the lab, you can weigh out solid materials using a balance, and then you can measure specific volumes of water using pipettes or burettes or uh, specific volumetric flasks used to contain very precise volumes of solution. When you know the moles of the material and the volume of the solution, you can determine its molarity and use that concentration unit of molarity to look at how the chemistry will happen. In this lab, you're going to be preparing solutions both from solid compounds as well as looking at dilutions, looking at taking different solutions that are already prepared and mixing them with each other and mixing them with water to dilute them and determine what is the final concentration after the additional volume is added. You're looking to see what is the concentration of the iron ion initially, and then after you mix it together, adding that new volume, that ion or those ions are spread over a larger area. It is diluted. And this lab looks at preparing solutions both from solid and by diluting uh, already prepared solutions and looking at the different stoichiometric ratio of solutions and looking at the moles and molarity of different solutions. This experiment looks at the concept of the mole and molarity, which in chemistry is the unit at which concentration is measured. The experiment looks at preparing a number of different solutions and determining how many moles are in a particular volume of that solution. That uh, solution itself is at a molarity, which is another measurement of concentration. So the mole itself is just a number, and that number is a very large number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That is one mole, just like a dozen is 12, a baker's dozen is 13, one mole of something is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of something. Um, and this is the unit that chemistry is based in. You're looking at, uh, if you look at a reaction and they say one mole of something reacts, that is an indication that it's one mole of atoms or one mole of molecules, meaning 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd 
molecules would react. On the periodic table, the different elements weigh different things, however. In a lab setting, you're measuring something out, you're in the real world, you're measuring something in grams. You can't go and physically count the atoms uh, to obtain this exact number of moles. So in lab settings, you have to measure things out based in grams, but the chemistry is done in units of moles. And these are interchanged back and forth between grams and moles throughout chemistry. And this is done through the molecular weight. So if you have a set number of moles to solve for the mass of that amount, so how much, how many, uh, how many grams does one mole weigh, or how many grams does 0 0.06 moles of something weigh, that would be looking, uh, multiplying it by the molecular weight. The molecular weight is in units of grams per mole. So if you multiply moles by the unit of grams divided by moles, the unit of moles cancels out and you're left with grams. The same would be true in the opposite direction. If you have a mass of something and you want to find out how many moles that is, you're dividing by the molecular weight. You're taking grams and it's when you divide by that uh, grams over moles, it's the same as multiplying moles over grams. The molecular weight is the ratio of how many grams there would be per one mole. Uh, so to determine how many moles a set mass would be, you're dividing by the molecular weight. The molecular weight itself is coming from the periodic table. All of the different elements on the periodic table have a set atomic weight. And this atomic weight is the mass, the amount of grams that it would take to comprise of one mole of those atoms. So one mole, 6.02 <clears throat> times 10 to the 23rd. Um, and on the periodic table, those atomic masses are for the atoms themselves. But to obtain a molecular weight or formula weight, this is for determining moles of entire compounds. And these compounds and these molecules are comprised or made up of multiple different atoms. So in the case of something like copper sulfate, there is one copper atom, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. To obtain one mole of copper, that would be 63.55 grams. One mole of sulfur would be 32.06 grams. And one mole of oxygen is 16 grams, but there are four of them. So to have four moles of oxygen, it would be 16 times four for 64 grams. Add all of these together and you end up with the overall molecular weight of copper sulfate, which is 159 0.61 grams. This is how much material in a lab setting would need to be measured or weighed out in order to obtain one mole of the compound of copper sulfate. The concept of the mole has already been touched on a little bit and uh, converting between grams and moles using molecular weight has been uh, covered uh, a little bit in the, in the past. 
but you're using the atomic weights of each of the different elements to create or generate the molecular weight for an individual molecule or compound. In the case of something like copper sulfate, there is one copper atom, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms in that copper sulfate compound. The molecular weight of that compound would be the mass of one copper plus one sulfur plus four oxygens. Add it together and that would give you the molecular weight of copper sulfate. The units of the atomic weights and molecular weights would be the unit of grams per mole. That is how much material, how many grams of material is needed for there to be one mole. It's a constant ratio for each atom or each element and for each molecule or compound. So as you're going through in chemistry, one of the best things you could probably do is if you're ever given an amount in grams, determine how many moles that would be. Chemistry is performed in the unit of moles, but you have to measure it in a lab in the unit of grams and converting between grams and moles is something that will come up continuously throughout chemistry labs, throughout chemistry courses, and throughout science in general. While you may have been converting grams to moles and moles to grams before in maybe some other labs or in lecture, this experiment is really looking at the concept of molarity. And molarity is a chemistry unit of concentration. There are many different types of concentration unit, you, units. You can have percentage, you can have parts per million, um, you could have mole fractions. These are different ways to express a concentration. How much of a material is in some amount of volume or some amount of total amount. Um, but in chemistry, molarity is the primary uh, unit of concentration. And this is particular for solutions or for uh, usually liquid samples, where you have a set number of moles of material spread out over some volume. The equation for molarity is moles over liters. This is actually the unit of molarity itself, uh, moles over liters, many times abbreviated as capital M. So, to calculate a molarity, you need both of these components. You need to know how many moles of compound you have and what volume is that spread across. So going back to this, uh, the example of copper sulfate, if 30 grams of copper sulfate is dissolved in a final volume of 250 milliliters, what would the molarity be? So the first thing in any sort of situation, if you have an amount, you have a mass, the best thing to do is convert that into how many moles would this be? So if you have 30 grams, you're converting it into moles. So you're dividing by the molecular weight. It's 30 divided by 159.61, will give 0 0.1879 moles of copper sulfate. The unit of molarity is moles per liter. And in the, this question, it's given in the unit of milliliters. So that wouldn't also need to be converted. There are 1000 milliliters in every one liter. So, to cancel out milliliters, you're dividing. 250 divided by 1,000 would give 
a volume of 0 0.250 liters. This is uh, the total number of moles that there are, and they are spread out around this volume. So when you take these and you can uh, divide moles by liters, you're left with the concentration of molarity. It's the ratio between how many moles there are in every liter. That means in this example, uh, there are 0.1879 moles spread across 0 0.250 liters. That gives a molarity of 0 0.7518. What the molarity means is that within one liter, there would be 0 0.7518 moles of copper sulfate in this particular uh, setup. This experiment is focusing on molarity, the concept of molarity, and using the molarity equation of moles over liter. Molarity is a concentration measurement. You're measuring how much material is there for every amount of volume that you happen to have. Same, at, uh, another concentration unit would just be percentage or parts per million. These are all ways to quantify how much of the material you actually have when it's dispersed in some amount of volume or some amount of space. So when you're preparing solutions, you're looking at moles over liters. So here I have 0 0.01 moles of copper sulfate pentahydrate. The molecular weight of copper sulfate pentahydrate is 249 grams per mole. And this is 2.49 grams. There is 0 0.01 moles of copper sulfate pentahydrate. When I combine that with 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters of water, the copper sulfate itself dissolves and instead of just a blue powder sunk to the bottom, you have a blue solution. The copper sulfate is dispersed throughout the water at a specific molarity with an amount of moles of 0 0.01 and a volume of 0.1 liters, the overall molarity of this would be 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.1 moles per liter, giving you a 0 0.1 molar solution of copper sulfate. When you're preparing solutions, you're taking that solid material, that solid compound, and dispersing it throughout a volume. Once you have the volume itself, you could then measure out a specific volume of this solution of known molarity and determine how many moles of compound would be contained in that solution. So if I have some volume, if I measure this volume, I could be able to see how many moles of copper sulfate I now have in these different portions. In chemistry courses such as this, general chemistry, you're typically looking at inorganic salts or compounds that dissolve in water. Um, you may have seen in balanced chemical reactions the subscript AQ. This means aqueous or dissolved in water. And when these salts or these ionic solids 
dissolve in water, they break apart into their individual ions. Sticking with the copper sulfate example, one molecule of or one molecule of copper sulfate will dissolve into its individual ions. That would be one copper two plus ion and one sulfate anion. That means if there is a concentration of, let's say, 0.25, a solution with a molarity of 0.25 molar copper sulfate, this is a 0.25 molar solution of copper ions, as well as a 0.25 molar solution of sulfate ions. How the compounds actually break apart and how many of these ions exist depend on the compound itself. So in the previous example of copper sulfate, every one molecule made one copper ion and one sulfate ion because these are the separate ions. If you had copper chloride, this breaks apart into one copper ion, but two chloride ions. Cl2 is not an ion by itself, but it's two separate chloride ions that are both separately bound to the copper. And knowing what these ions are and how they break apart in solution is something that is critical when you're dealing uh, with solutions in chemistry labs. You want to know specifically if you want to prepare a solution or look at the concentration of chloride, using copper chloride, there'd be twice as much as if you used sodium chloride of the same molarity. If they were both 0.1 molar copper chloride and sodium chloride, the copper chloride would have twice as much chloride in it. So if there was again the 0.25 molar solution of now copper chloride, that would be 0.25 molar copper ion because for every one molecule there was one copper ion, but double the amount of the chloride concentration. And that concentration would be 0.50 molar chloride ion, because for every one molecule, there can be two ions that dissolve in the solution. So when you look at these different compounds and look at solutions of these, you're looking at solutions of the individual ions. So in the case of cerium sulfate, there would be three cerium ions and two sulfate ions. Nickel nitrate would have one nickel ion and two nitrate ions. And if you were to combine two different solutions that were all aqueous, you would have a solution of copper ion, a solution of cerium ion, and sulfate ion coming from both uh, initial compounds. When solutions are prepared using ionic solids, it's not a solution of the whole compound itself, but the solution of the different ions. Barium ions and, or barium nitrate will have no reaction with sodium chloride. However, by changing one of the ions, by changing the, cat, uh, the anion from chloride to sulfate, there is a reaction. Specifically what's happening, the barium itself is reacting with the sulfate. There was no reaction with the barium and the chloride. 
The same thing can be seen if you change the cation. By changing it from barium to potassium, there's again no reaction with the sodium chloride, but now there's also no reaction with the sodium sulfate. By switching out the different cation, there are different reactions. In these solutions, all of these different compounds break apart into their individual ions, where the 0.1 molar solution of barium nitrate would be a 0.1 molar solution of barium ions, but a 0.2 molar solution of nitrate anions because for every one barium nitrate, there are two nitrate ions. In the case of sodium sulfate, the overall concentration of sodium sulfate was 0.1 molar. However, because this splits into individual ions, that means the concentration of sodium cations would be 0.2 because there are two sodium ions, and the concentration of sulfate would be 0.1, because there is only one sulfate ion. These are the what reacts when you perform a reaction. You're looking at the reaction of the individual ions in solution and not the solid compound, but it's the ions that play a role. When you prepare a solution, you need to take into account how many ions are there in the compound and how those would affect the overall molarity of both the cation and the anion. Another concept when dealing with solutions is the concept of dilution. You're taking some amount that you have and spreading it over a larger volume. So this happens all the time. If you have a drink with ice in it and over time that ice melts, you might say it's watered down. But what's happening is that initial drink is now diluted with more water. Those molecules or ions or drink particles are now spread out over a larger volume. And there's a particular calculation when you're using uh, molarities and volumes that specifically looks at dilutions, and it's all based on the molarity calculation. So the molarity calculation, again, is moles over liters. For every uh, liter, it contains this amount of moles. That's the <clears throat> concept of molarity. So when you're solving for a dilution, one of the key things to remember is that the number of moles stays the same. The moles are constant throughout the dilution. You're just taking those moles and spreading them out over a larger volume. So in this example, a 30 milliliter solution, uh, 0.5 molar solution of copper sulfate is combined with 50 milliliters of water. What would the final molarity be? You're taking a solution and you're spreading it out over a larger volume. So there are two sides when you perform a dilution. You have initial and you have final. And both of them have the molarity, the moles, and the volume. The moles are constant throughout it. You didn't add any more material. You didn't subtract any more material. You just added more volume. So initially, you're starting with a concentration and a volume. So you can use those two numbers to calculate how many moles of copper sulfate were present initially. That number of moles now ends up being spread out across a larger volume. 
that 30 milliliters plus the additional 50 milliliters of water. So that same number of moles is now spread out over a larger volume of 80 milliliters. And so you have moles and you have a volume and you calculate what is that final molarity. So initially, 30 milliliters of the 0.5 molar solution, you're multiplying those together to get the number of moles, 0 0.015 moles of copper sulfate, and that is spread out now over a larger volume. The end molarity is 0 0.1875. What started as a higher concentration solution is now lower by adding uh, some of that volume. Because these are both, both sides of the equation contain moles, that it contains the amount of material spread throughout, and that's constant, you can set these two equations equal to each other. So the molarity times the, the initial molarity or the starting molarity times that initial volume or starting volume equals some amount of moles. And that is constant in the next stage. Those moles are now spread out over this final volume resulting in a final molarity. So when you're looking through dilutions you and working through these types of problems, the typical uh, dilution equation is M1, V1, or initial molarity, initial volume, equals M2, V2, the final molarity and final volume. And what this entire equation is, is two of these molarity calculations separate, but then set equal to each other by solving for the number of moles that are constant throughout the dilution. Another way to use the molarity equation and using the concept of moles, volume, and molarity is through dilutions. And this would be determining how many moles there are in very, uh, as you change the concentration. So in the case of potassium permanganate, potassium permanganate is a very intensely colored uh, purple solution. However, by diluting this solution, the concentration is lowering. The same number of moles are always present, but by adding more and more water, they are now dispersed throughout the entire solution. By adding further amounts of water, the overall concentration is decreased, but the number of moles present is still uh, the same. They're now just spread out over a larger volume. And Calculating through di uh, dilution calculations, that's something that needs to be remembered, is the number of moles is the same both before and after the dilution. The only thing that's changing is the amount that it's dispersed in. So the volume is changing, and that's changing the molarity. So you can take two molarity calculations, molarity equals moles over liters, and set them both equal to moles. And then that would give you the uh, relationship between molarity and volume of one solution versus molarity and volume of, an, of another. As you change those ratios, you're changing the molarity but the number of moles, the actual compound itself, is still the same. You're just diluting it and spreading it over a larger volume.
in the experiment itself in lab, you'll be preparing and diluting a number of different solutions. From these solution preparations, you're going to be looking at the molarity of the varying solutions, looking at the moles contained in each of these different solutions. And in the first part, at least, use these ratios, use these combinations of moles to determine the empirical formula of the product. In the first part of the experiment, this is what's called Job's method. You're going to be combining two different solutions in varying amounts and recording the intensity of the purple color from the product. You're going to be preparing a total of nine different solutions. And in each solution, there is exactly 10.00 milliliters. Based on the concentration provided on the stock solution bottles themselves, you can use the molarity and the volume of each solution to determine how many moles are contained in each one of your test tubes. So for example, the moles of Fe3+, the moles of iron 3 plus ion, would be the concentration or the molarity given on the, uh, the stock bottles themselves times the volume used of that particular solution that will give you the moles of iron 3 plus. To determine the molarity of the iron 3 plus, that number of moles that was just determined would be divided by the new final volume, which in each one of these cases is exactly 10.00 milliliters. In each of these nine test tubes, you can determine the moles of the Fe3 plus and therefore the molarity of the Fe3 plus, as well as the moles of sulfosalicylic acid, abbreviated SSA. You could, you could also use these moles to determine the mass of something. So this compound here is the sulfosalicylic acid molecule. This is written in organic chemistry notation and ha it has a molecular weight of 218.178 grams per mole. So in each one of these nine solutions, you can determine the mole, the individual moles of the two components that are contained in uh, in those solutions, as well as their molarities. When you have those moles, you can also determine the mole fraction. This is the number of uh, the amount of moles of one compound over the total moles in uh, the solution or in the reaction. The mo mole fraction of iron or F Fe3 plus would be the moles of iron 3 plus divided by the total moles of Fe3 plus plus the moles of SSA. And you'd be determining that for each one of these nine solutions for both the SSA and the Fe3 plus, as well as measuring the absorbance of each one of these solutions. Using the spectrophotometers in lab, you're going to be measuring the intensity of the purple color, which is related to the concentration. And using those values and the mole fraction of each solution or each test tube, you'll be able to graphically determine what is the empirical formula of the product of the SSA and iron three plus. In the first part of the experiment, you're going to be reacting solutions of iron three nitrate and five sulfosalicylic acid, which is abbreviated SSA. The combination of these compounds, 
produces a very intensely colored complex. The purple color of the, the product is a combination of iron-3 ions and SSA molecules. In the experiment, you'll be determining what is the ratio of iron to SSA. And to do this, you'll be preparing nine different solutions and measuring the intensity of the resulting purple color. You will be using the pipettes to dispense the appropriate amount of solution in each of the nine test tubes. In the first solution, you would have one milliliter of iron nitrate solution and nine milliliters of the SSA solution. In the second test tube, you would have two milliliters of the iron nitrate solution and eight milliliters of the SSA solution. In each of the nine test tubes, there will be a total of 10 milliliters. Using the pipette, you can draw up a volume and then dispense the appropriate amount. I'm starting at the zero mark and I can dispense to the 1.00 milliliter mark. Starting at 1.00, I can dispense two milliliters and have a final re volume reading of 3.00. Starting at the 3 mark to dispense 3 milliliters, I can dispense that all the way down to the 6.00 milliliter mark. And I can continue this method all the way through, stopping to refill my pipette when needed. Likewise, I can add the sulfosalicylic acid. It is best to use a separate pipette to avoid any contamination between your two solutions. The concentrations of the two solutions are very low, and yet the color can be very intense. So any stray contamination could uh, could generate some of this colored product. Just like with the iron nitrate, I can add in, I can adjust the volume and bring that up to the zero mark and then dispense in the first test tube nine milliliters for a total of 10 milliliters of solution. I can then draw up more liquid into the pipette. And in the second test tube, dispense only eight milliliters. And continue on with seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. As you prepare these solutions, you'll notice the intensity of the color changing and going up and down. You can then measure the intensity of this color using the spectrophotometers in the room. Once you have the absorbance and the intensity readings of all of your solutions recorded, you can prepare a graph of the mole fraction of SSA on the x-axis and the absorbance value of each solution on the y-axis. As the ratio between the two compounds, iron-3 ion and the SSA, comes to its stoichiometric ratio, the intensity of that color
and therefore the absorbance reading from the spectrophotometer will be at its height and then will continue to fall as the ratio goes to the other side. By plotting this graph, you can figure out where is the maximum ratio that produces the most uh, intense color and the highest absorbance. That is the ratio that produces the most of the, co of the colored product and would be the ratio of iron and SSA in its final complex product. In the lab itself, to prepare these nine different solutions, you're going to be measuring the volumes using pipettes. These pipettes are meant to record how much volume is delivered or how much volume leaves the pipette and is dispensed into the individual test tubes. These pipettes can be read out to 0 0.01 milliliters, so all of the volume readings from a pipette should have two decimal places. You would draw up the volume into the pipette itself using either a pipette bulb or a pipette pump, and then drain the liquid out from the tip into the appropriate test tubes. As with uh, using a burette, the volume delivered would be the final volume reading minus the initial volume reading. You'll notice that when the, the pipette is filled, it reads zero. And at the end, when you're finished dispensing some volume, it is now a larger number. You're to determine the volume dispensed from the pipette, it would be the final volume reading minus the initial volume reading. Using a pipette to dispense a liquid is similar to using a burette. Both pipettes and burettes are meant to, to show you the volume delivered from the instrument. The number readings on both the pipette and the burette are read down. This is the volume that is dispensed from the pipette itself. To use the pipette, you'll first need to fill the pipette with the liquid. This can be done either using a pipette bulb or a pipette pump. To pipette using a pipette bulb, the bulb itself is very loosely placed on the opening of the pipette, squeezed, and then placed inside the solution in order to draw up some liquid. As you release the pressure on the pipette bulb, liquid is drawn up into the pipette. And for quick release, you can drop the pipette bulb and cover the pipette with your thumb. This allows all of the liquid inside the pipette to remain, and you can use the pressure on your thumb to slowly release the liquid in the pipette to the appropriate level. You can then transfer the liquid to the appropriate container. As you release the liquid by adjusting the pressure on your thumb, the liquid level itself is going down, indicating that you have dispensed a larger volume to your container. Please note that just like the pipettes, or that just like the burettes, the graduations on a pipette do not go all the way down to the very tip. Therefore, you should generally stop at the 9 milliliter mark. There are a few graduations below that, but afterwards, 
the tip volume is not calibrated. The volume in the tip at the moment is unknown. And this does not mean that it is one additional milliliter. Many times when using the pipettes, you'll notice that it, they go above the zero mark to the negative one or sometimes the negative two mark. You can draw the liquid all the way up past the zero mark to any of these points and use that as your initial volume reading of the burette, of the pipette. As with a burette, the volume dispensed is the final reading minus the initial reading. To dispense volume from a pipette using a pipette pump, the pump itself is fixed to the end of the pipette. When doing so, please hold the pipette close to where you are placing the pump onto the pipette itself. This can be fixed where it is snugly fit on the pipette. Using the dial, you can draw liquid up into the pipette or dispense liquid from the pipette. As with the pipette bulb, you can draw liquid up into the pipette itself to the appropriate level. With the pipette pump, you can dispense the liquid itself by reversing the direction of the wheel. As you do this, the liquid level is decreasing in the pipette. The numbers on the pipette are increasing, indicating this is the volume that was dispensed from the pipette itself. As with the with the pipette bulb, you do not want to dispense the liquid all the way to the very tip. Typically, you would want to dispense to where there are still graduations and markings on the pipette itself. You can always redraw up more liquid into the pipette in order to dispense more in the other container. Just be sure to know what is your initial pipette reading and what is your final pipette reading to, in order to determine what is the volume that is dispensed from your pipette. With the different solutions prepared, you can calculate the moles of each component contained in all of those nine test tubes, as well as their mole fraction. To determine the number of moles in each one of those uh, nine test tubes, you're going to use the molarity calculation, the molarity equation. The molarity of a solution is equal to moles divided by liters. In the first test tube, you're measuring out one milliliter or 0 0.001 liters of the iron three nitrate solution and you have the molarity of that iron three nitrate solution, the molarity that's given to you on the stock bottle itself. By multiplying those two together, the molarity or the concentration times the volume that is used of that particular solution, you can solve for how many moles are contained in that particular test tube. You'll be determining the moles contained in each test tube for both the iron 3 plus ion as well as that sulfosalicylic acid molecule, the SSA. Once you have the, mol the moles of iron 3 plus and the moles of SSA, you can determine the mole fraction of each of them. The mole fraction is the percentage or the fraction of that particular component out of all of the moles involved in the particular reaction. 
In this reaction, it's a combination of iron three plus ions and those SSA molecules and no other components. So the total number of moles involved in this reaction is those two components, the moles of Fe3 plus and the moles of the SSA. To determine the mole fraction of the Fe3 plus, you're taking the moles of iron, divide it by these total number of moles involved in this particular reaction. The moles of SSA is just uh, is calculated in the same way, except you're looking at the moles of the SSA divided by, again, the total moles involved in this particular reaction. These are the fractions of moles that are involved in this reaction. If you combine all of the mole fractions together, you should equal a value of one or 100% to make sure all of these moles and all of these uh, molecules are accounted for in these particular solutions. So in preparing these solutions and performing the calculations, you're determining the mole fraction of Fe3 plus and the mole fraction of the SSA molecule in all nine of your test tubes. Spectroscopy is when light interacts directly with chemicals, either in chemical solutions or uh, objects. Light itself typically is white light, so light coming from the sun. And this consists of all different wavelengths. And in spectroscopy, typically a single wavelength or a single energy of light is selected and it's seen how the chemical will interact with that particular type of energy uh, light source. So light in uh, spectroscopy and in spectrophotometers refers to or looks at light that's transmitted and light that's absorbed. Transmitted light is just kind of like it sounds. There's a light source and the chemical solution. The light passes through the solution and some of it, not all of it, is transmitted through to the other side. The reverse of that is the light that is absorbed by the solution. The light energy comes in, it's blocked by the solution, absorbed by those chemicals, and then that increases the energy of those chemicals and can cause various different things, either change in energy levels of the electrons, it can change how fast or how often uh, chemical bonds vibrate uh, between atoms, or even just how the molecule itself rotates around uh, in the solution, and how the light interacts with the chemical will depend on what wavelength and what energy of light that's being used. Absorbance and transmittance are not uh, linearly related. While transmittance is the amount of light that passes through to the other side, absorbance is the amount of light that's blocked. It's not a direct linear relationship. Um, they are logarithmically related to each other. So as the transmittance uh, decreases and the absorbance increases, it's absorbed it's increasing by a greater amount at this low percent uh, transmittance. And they're related through this equation. You can easily convert between one and the other uh, using this equation here, where absorbance is equal to two minus the log of the percent transmission. And this percent transmission is the whole number. So if the percent transmittance was 60%, the absorbance would be 
2 minus the log of 60. You don't have to convert it to uh, a decimal. It's easier to measure the percent transmittance because usually a detector in uh, an instrument is detecting how much light is coming in. Um, and that is linearly re related. And then it can be converted through the log to absorbance. Once you have the solutions prepared, you're going to be measuring the absorbance and transmittance of them using a Spectronic 20. And this is the instrument that would be in the lab room. So you can see here the different parts of the Spectronic 20, the different readouts of both the wavelength percent transmittance, uh, the sample holder where you will place the different samples, the adjustment for wavelength, and then the on-off switch, which is the left-hand knob, and the left and right front knobs are also used for the calibration procedure. To calibrate a Spectronic 20, this needs to be done each time you turn it on, as well as every time you change the wavelength of light that's being used. So you'd first turn on the instrument using the left knob and adjust it to the appropriate wavelength that you're going to be using. Make sure there is nothing in the sample holder and that the sample holder is uh, clo closed. You can then use the left hand knob to dial to a percent transmittance of zero and then place in your solvent. Typically this is water, but in other situations, it could be whichever type of solvent you're using to dissolve or dilute your particular sample. In this experiment, you're using uh, water. So water, tap water, is going to be your solvent. That would be the cuvette containing that sample would be placed inside the, the sample holder, making sure that it's lined up correctly. And then the right-hand knob is dialed to 100%, uh, indicating that the solvent itself is, it's telling the instrument that the solvent, all light is able to pass through that. And that gives you a two-point calibration. You can then take your sa uh, solvent out, place your sample inside the cuvette holder, and record the percent transmittance. Operating and calibrating the Spectronic 20 is done with the three control knobs on the instrument. The left-hand knob is used to turn the power on to the instrument itself. The top control knob changes the wavelength of light being used to measure the absorbance and transmittance. At this point, I can adjust the wavelength to 480 nanometers. To begin the calibration process, which is done at each wavelength, you can first use the left control knob to adjust the reading to 0% transmittance. This is done while the chamber is completely empty. When the instrument is adjusted to a 0% transmittance, you can then take a cuvette containing your solvent, typically water, and place it in the, cu in the holder. You'll notice that these cuvettes all have a line on the cuvette itself. This is to make sure that you always place the cuvette in the same direction and orientation each time you place it in the spectrophotometer. The spectrophotometer itself also has a little mark, which you can line up with the cuvette. With the cuvette containing your solvent inside the spectrophotometer,
you can now use the right control knob and adjust this to 100% transmittance. This is a two-point calibration where it tells the instrument when the light is off and there is no sample, there should be 0% of the light getting through to the other side. Likewise, when you put in your solvent, you want it to read 100% because at this point, you're only interested in the absorbance of your sample, not the solvent. So any absorbance that's coming from water itself can be corrected for. There is usually a small amount of drift associated with the actual value, so plus or minus 0.2 for uh, the calibration and measurements is acceptable. You can then remove your solvent cuvette and place your sample cuvette inside. Again, making sure that the markings are lined up on the spectrophotometer. When this is done, you can then record the percent transmittance of this particular sample. The percent transmittance can then be convert it into an absorbance for you to either determine concentration or molar absorptivity. So once you have the mole fraction of the different components for all of your nine test tubes, as well as the absorbance of your nine different solutions, you can then prepare a graph you're going to be graphing the absorbance reading on the y-axis versus the mole fraction of the SSA on the x-axis. And what you should get or what you should see is really two straight lines. There's the, uh, there's the different data points where the absorbance is increasing to a point and there's a set of data points where the absorbance is decreasing. These are two separate lines. And when you graph these, you can plot them either as two separate series in Excel or a graphing program. So that way you can obtain two separate trend lines or if you're graphing by hand, you would draw two separate trend lines for these two different uh, portions of the data, of these data points. And if you extend the lines beyond where uh, the data points uh, finish, so in this case, extending the trend line beyond this last point, and here extending the trend line beyond that first point, you're going to see where these two trend lines intersect or where they cross one another. And where they cross one another, that is the mole ratio of the final product itself. This is the ratio of the product. It's the theoretical point where the absorbance and therefore the concentration of the product is at its height, is at its height. It's the highest concentration, the highest intensity at this mole fraction. And using this mole fraction where the absorbance or the concentration is the highest, you can determine what is the empirical formula for the compound itself. This example graph is of the copper and ammonia complex. As the fraction of the ammonia NH3 is increasing, the absorbance of the product is also increasing up to a point at which it starts to decrease again, usually at a different slope. Where these intersect, this point, this cross point, is the highest 
absorbance, that's the highest concentration of product. So this maximum amount at 0.8, this is the highest uh, concentration and this is the mole fraction of the ammonia that is contained in the product itself. So if you have the mole fraction of one component, you can also determine the mole fraction of the other component. In the example, the copper two plus ion. One minus the mole fraction of the other component will give you the mole fraction of, in this case, copper two plus. Once you have the mole fraction of both components, you can divide them. In this case, with a mole fraction of NH3 as 0.8 and a mole fraction of copper 2 plus as 0.2, when you divide them, it gives the whole number of four. This means that the ratio of ammonia to the copper 2 plus is four. For every one copper, there are four ammonia molecules. So if you have four ammonias and one copper in the final product, you would have this particular format. One copper, four ammonia molecules. And you'll notice in your observations. So in this case and in the lab setting, what you're working with, with the iron and the SSA, there is no solid precipitate. If you look back at those previous solutions, these are purple solutions. They are not any precipitate. They are clear, you can see through them, they just have a color change. So when you're looking at these different compounds, they are not in a solid phase. The product is not a solid. It is still an aqueous co compound. It is an aqueous product. You'll also notice that ammonia, just like the SSA, has no charge. So the final charge or the oxidation state of the final product is still the charge of the metal ion. You're adding up all of the charges together and that's what would give you the final charge of the product. In this case, with ammonia not having a charge on it, and you have four of them, so that would be all four of these zeros plus the charge of the copper, which is two plus. So overall, the charge on the product is still two plus. So what you're going to be doing in the lab once you have the absorbance values uh, record it, you have the mole fraction, and you're looking to see what is the mole fraction of the two components at that intersection point, you can determine the stoichiometric ratio and determine the final product empirical formula. The next part of the experiment involves preparing solutions for yourself. You're going to be taking solid materials, dissolving them in water, and preparing actual solutions, and then combining a couple of them together and measuring their absorbance on a spectrophotometer. So in the lab, you'll be pre be preparing one solution of aluminum sulfate and then one solution of a transition metal sulfate, either copper sulfate, which is blue, nickel sulfate, which is green, or cobalt sulfate, which is red. All of these solid compounds appear as hydrates. For example, the copper sulfate solution the copper sulfate solid is given or provided as copper to sulfate pentahydrate. There are five water molecules already contained 
in that solid for every one molecule of copper to sulfate, there are five waters already in there in the solid. For these hydrate type materials, you must include the mass of these five waters when you are looking at the molecular weight of the overall compound. So in the lab itself, you're going to be measuring out a mass of aluminum sulfate and a separate mass of one of these transition metal sulfates. You'll dissolve both of these in 50 milliliters of water. You'll prepare two different solutions in 50 milliliters of water. Stir those around, make sure all of the solid is completely dissolved. Then you're going to take one portion of your transition metal solution, pour it in a third beaker, and one portion of the aluminum sulfate solution and combine those two. You're performing a dilution of all of these ions with a different solution. So in that final solution, that mixture, you'll have both aluminum ions, sulfate ions coming from both copper, uh, aluminum sulfate and your transition metal sulfate. And then you'll also have your transition metal ion. So you mix those two, two solutions together and now you have three different solutions. In the calculations, based on your measurements, your measurements. How much mass did you actually record, weigh out? And what volume of water did you use? You can determine the exact number of moles and the exact molarity of each of your three solutions. Last, you'll take those three solutions and measure the absorbance using a spectrophotometer and use your measurement and your calculated values to see how close they actually are to each other. This part of the experiment involves preparing solutions from solid salt compounds. You'll be preparing two solutions from solid material. One solution of aluminum sulfate and one solution of either cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate, or copper sulfate. For each solution, you'll be weighing a, a mass of the solid powder and dissolving that in 50 milliliters of water. You will be weighing between one and two grams of each solid powder and dissolving that. A useful lab component is weighing paper, which you can use to weigh the solid material. Solid material should never be placed directly on the balance pan itself. When using weighing paper, it's very useful to fold it in half first, diagonally, so that way it forms a, an area for the solid powder to be placed. You can either use a, an empty beaker or a piece of weighing paper as the vessel to contain the solid material. You'll make sure that the balance is teared and reading zero and place the weighing paper on the balance pan itself. You could also use this using an empty beaker. With the weighing paper or beaker on the balance, you can tear the balance for it to read zero. You can then take your selected compound and add approximately one to two grams of solid material. 
to read the balance, you should close the balance first to make sure there are no air drafts, as this is a sensitive balance and those could affect the results. You can then record the mass of your powder. With the mass of the solid powder and the name of the solid material, you can determine the molecular weight of the material and therefore the moles of the solid powder. Keep in mind all of the materials you'll be working with are hydrated formulas. That is there is already water contained in the solid itself. The molecular weight of the solid material then includes the mass of that water. To prepare the solution you'll measure out 50 milliliters of water and then place the solid material into an empty beaker and dissolve that in the 50 milliliters of water. Once the solid and the liquid are combined you can use your stirring rod to mix the solution together. You want to mix the solution and wait until all of the solid material is dissolved. You'll be preparing two solutions. One solution of a transition metal sulfate, either cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate, or copper sulfate. Each of these are a colored salt and you'll prepare that solution and wait for the material to dissolve. You will also prepare a solution of aluminum sulfate octadecahydrate. Aluminum sulfate salts contain a large amount of water in its hydrated form, so you need to remember to include all of the water molecules when determining its molecular weight. With the mass of each material, you can determine the moles of each material, and using the volume of 50 milliliters, you can calculate the concentration or the molarity of each of the two solutions. The third solution that you'll be preparing is a combination of your two prepared solutions. You'll take between 10 and 40 milliliters of one solution and place that in a small beaker and then determine the the difference of the solutions for a total volume of 50 milliliters. In this case, I used 40 milliliters of the copper sulfate solution, therefore I would use 10 milliliters of the aluminum sulfate solution. So there is a total volume of 50 milliliters. With all three solutions prepared, you will then take the absorbance reading at the indicated wavelength of each of your three solutions. Each colored transition metal salt will have a different wavelength which you will calibrate the spectrophotometer for. You will then measure the percent transmittance of each of your three solutions. Using the provided uh, equation, you can relate the absorbance of the solution with the concentration of the transition metal ion, in this case the copper 2 plus ion. You'll then be comparing what is the calculated concentration of copper 2 plus in each of these three solutions and compare that to the measured concentration using the spectrophotometer. So with the solutions prepared, you're going to be determining what are the molarities 
of the solutions and the molarities, not only in terms of the molecule itself, but also of each of the individual components, all of the different ions. So first you need to determine how many moles are present in each one of your two prepared uh, solutions. The one that's uh, the solutions you're preparing using the weighed out solid material. Moles are equal to the grams divided by the molecular weight. So both the aluminum sulfate and the transition metal sulfate you'll weigh out separately and add into two separate beakers. So you have two different masses. You have two different amounts in grams. And so you can divide each of those by their respective molecular weights. And you can use that to determine how many moles of the component there actually is. Once you have the moles of the component, you can use the molar ratios to determine or to look and see how many moles of each different ion there is in those two different solutions. So in the case of something like copper chloride, this has one copper two plus ion and two chloride ions contained in it. So if you have one mole of copper chloride, when it's dissolved, you have one mole of copper two plus and two moles of Cl minus ions in that solution. In the case of something like calcium phosphate, these molecules are broken up into their ions. Phosphate is a polyatomic ion, the same as sulfate, which is a polyatomic ion. These break apart into their individual ions. And so in this case of calcium phosphate, there are three calcium ions and two phosphate ions that break apart. So if you know the moles of the total component using the molecular weight, you can also know the moles of each of the individual ions. You'll then be determining the molarity of the solutions. The molarity of the whole solution as uh, the solution itself, as well as the molarity of the individual ions. And the molarity is the moles divided by the liters. In solutions A and B, those first two solutions that you're preparing from the solid material, the volume is 50 milliliters or should be 50 milliliters. If you happen to measure out a little bit less or uh, volume, you can record that and it will still be the correct molarity so long as you make sure to record and use the, uh, the measured volume. So you're taking your moles and dividing by the volume to determine the molarity. In that third solution, you can determine the number of moles based on the molarity of your initial solutions multiplied by the volume of each of those that you use. That will give you the moles of each component that is coming from those two separate solutions and then divide that by the new volume. In the case of the two metal ions, the aluminum three plus ion and the transition metal ion, those are just dilutions. You're taking those ions and you're adding more volume of a different solution. There's no additional components coming in there. So in the case of the cations, the uh, the aluminum three plus and the transition metal, you're performing a dilution. However, in the case of the sulfate, you are having sulfate come in from two different solutions. You're preparing solutions of aluminum sulfate 
and a metal uh, transition metal sulfate. You have sulfate ions coming from two different sources. So you need to take the moles of sulfate that is coming from just solution A plus the moles of sulfate that is coming from just solution B and using that to determine what is the uh, final molarity of sulfate ions themselves. Once you have all three of your solutions prepared, you can look to see what is the theoretical molarity of all of these different solutions. You're using the mass of solid that you measure to determine the moles of solute moles of the different components and the volume to determine the final molarity. But many times in labs, there are errors associated with measurements and errors associated with preparing solutions. So this looks at calculating what an amount of error would be in this type of a measurement. You're going to be using the spectrophotometers to measure the exact uh, absorbance of all three of your solutions and relate that to a concentration. All three of the transition metals that you can choose from have a different appearance. They're all a different color of solution. And so the absorbance reading each happens at a different wavelength. In the case of cobalt sulfate, you would measure all three of your solutions at a wavelength of 515 nanometers. If you chose copper sulfate solution, you would measure all three of your solutions at a wavelength of 645 nanometers. And if you've chosen the nickel sulfate, you would measure all three of your solutions at 660 nanometers. When you have the absorbance, each one of these compounds also can relate to a concentration. The absorbance is equal to a constant times the molarity. So if you know the absorbance and the particular constant, you can solve for what is the molarity, your measured molarity of the solution. So once you have the absorbance of each one of your solutions at the one wavelength that you've chosen, you can then use this equation to determine what is the measured molarity based on your absorbance reading. So in the case of an example like this, weighing out a mass of 1.2345 grams of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate and dissolving that in 50 milliliters of water. The absorbance of this solution is then measured as 0.267. What is the percent error? So first you know the mass of the material so you can use the mass and the molecular weight of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate to determine how many moles of this compound there actually is. So in this case, you have with the molecular weight of 249.68 grams per mole, you have the total number of moles of copper sulfate pentahydrate as 0 0.0049443 moles. These moles are dispersed throughout a total volume of 50 milliliters. So you can determine the molarity of your solution, 0 0.09889 molar, very close to 0 0.1 this would be the calculated molarity. This is the theoretical maximum molarity of this particular solution. But in the lab, it's telling you the, uh, 
the measured absorbance is 0.267. So you can see what the equation is for copper sulfate solution. And the absorbance is equal to 2.524 times the molarity. So by inserting the absorbance into the equation, you can solve for the molarity of the solution. In this case, the molarity is equal to 0.106 molar. This is your measured molarity. And the percent error is the measured value minus the calculated value, all divided by the calculated value times 100%. So in this case, if the measured molarity is 0.106 molar and the calculated molarity is 0 0.09889 molar, you can work this through and determine that the percent error of this measurement or in this situation was 7.19%. So for all three of your solutions, both the transition metal sulfate solution, the aluminum sulfate solution, and that combination solution, solution three or solution C, you're going to be choosing the wavelength and measuring the absorbance and then calculating from the absorbance what is the per, the uh, measured molarity and the percent error of your solution. When you're measuring the percent transmittance and the absorbance using the spectrophotometer, you're only measuring these concentrations of the ion that displays the color. And that ion is the transition metal ion. If you chose the copper to sulfate solution, you're looking at the measured concentration of the copper two plus ion. That's the ion that displays the blue color. The sulfate by itself does not have any sort of a color and the aluminum by itself does not have any sort of a color. So when you're measuring the absorbance in the lab, you're measuring the absorbance of that transition metal ion. So in this example of the copper two sulfate, you have the absorbance being measured of the copper two ion. It is a 0 0.09889 molar solution of copper two plus ion, and that's what is measured through the spectrophotometer. When you look at the other two solutions, only one of them should contain some of that transition metal, that third solution, that combination. That still has some of the transition metal ion in it. The aluminum sulfate solution theoretically has no copper two plus. However, the measured absorbance could still give you a reading. It most likely will not be exactly 100% transmittance. So if it does give you a slight uh, absorbance, if it's 99.9, percent transmittance or 98 percent transmittance, you can calculate what that concentration would be and determine the percent error. The problem is you don't have or the you don't theoretically have a concentration of copper two plus. It should be zero in the aluminum sulfate solution. So you really can just look at the percent, the percent uh, difference from zero absorbance and what you're actually measuring. The other thing I'd like to point out right now is especially when you get to these very strange uh, solutions, 
you're looking at zero, you, it should have a 100% absorbance. But many times instruments in real lab settings do have variability. If something is exact 100% and even and there's no variability, most likely something's broken. So when you're in a lab and you're looking at an actual measured value, it is a possibility that it could give a percent transmittance higher than 100%, even though that's theoretically impossible. You can't have more light coming in through uh, from the other side than what you start it with, and you can't have a negative molarity. If there is a slight variability, particularly with this aluminum sulfate solution, because it should read 100%, and there's that variability, it might go slightly over 100%, and that's okay. If it goes a little farther beyond 100%, so I would say over 105%, there might be some sort of a, a, an error with the calibration of the instrument. So do a quick calibration again, um, and then try to remeasure this solution. It should be very, very, very close to 100%. And you'll convert that percent transmittance into an absorbance and see what the error is based on the theoretical value of zero molar and a zero percent uh, absorbance or zero absorbance. That third solution, however, does have that transition metal in it. You're taking that transition metal solution and combining it with aluminum sulfate. So if you know the calculated molarity of that initial solution and the volume which you use, you can determine how many moles of the metal ion or how many moles of that transition metal ion are going to be contained in that third solution. You're multiplying the concentration times the volume that was used, and that will give you how many moles are contained in that third solution. The molarity then is that number of moles divided by the total volume. In this case, there are 30 milliliters of the initial copper sulfate solution, and 20 milliliters of the aluminum sulfate solution. So a combined volume again of 50 milliliters. So when you take the moles of copper ion, divide it by the total volume of 50 milliliters, the theoretical concentration of this solution would be 0 0.05933 molar. The example gives that it had a measured absorbance of 0.133. So looking at the molarity of the copper two plus ion, your measured molarity was 0 0.0527 molar. So now you have a measured molarity and a calculated theoretical molarity, and you can determine a percent error of this particular solution. So overall in this experiment, you're looking at two different parts. The first part of the experiment, you're performing a number of different solutions. You're preparing nine different solutions with combinations of iron three nitrate and sulfosalicylic acid. You're determining in each one of these nine, uh, nine test tubes how many moles of iron three plus there is, how many moles of sulfosalicylic acid there is, and determining their mole fractions. You're then measuring the percent transmittance on the spectrophotometer at a wavelength of 408 nanometers and determining the absorbance or the intensity of the product at each one of these combinations.
You can then prepare a graph of the absorbance on the y-axis and the mole fraction of SSA on the x-axis. And where the two lines intersect, that is the mole fraction of the final product. And you can use those mole fractions to determine what is the empirical formula of the final product of iron three plus and sulfosalicylic acid. In the second part of the experiment, you're preparing solutions yourself. You're preparing two solutions from solid material, a solution of aluminum sulfate, which will be clear and colorless, as well as a solution of a transition metal sulfate, either cobalt sulfate, copper sulfate, or nickel sulfate. And these three solutions, you'll be choosing one, have a color associated with them. In each of these two solutions, you're going to be determining how many moles are present using the um, weighed mass and the molecular weight, and determine the molarity of these solutions using the moles and the volume of 50 milliliters. With the moles and molarity of the solution or the compound themselves, you can also see the moles and molarity of each ion. In the aluminum sulfate solution, what is the molarity of aluminum three plus and what is the molarity of sulfate? In the transition metal sulfate solution, what is the molarity of the transition metal ion and what is the molarity of the sulfate? You'll then combine some portion of these two solutions to prepare a third solution. And that third solution has, will have some aluminum ions in it, some transition metal ion in it, and sulfate from both solutions. So you can determine how many moles of each compound or each ion is, are present and the molarity of each ion. You're then going to be measuring the percent transmittance of these three solutions at the appropriate wavelength and using the provided equation to determine what is the measured molarity of your three solutions. These, the measured molarity is specifically for the transition metal ion. So with the aluminum sulfate solution, the theoretical concentration of transition metal ion is zero. There should not be any absorbance in the aluminum sulfate solution, but you will see some amount of absorbance. So you'll go through that, look at the measured absorbance, and look at the calculated uh, concentration and determine the percent error of the measurement and of the experiment. So in this lab, you were looking at preparing a lot of different solutions. You took solutions of iron nitrate and sulfosalicylic acid and made different mixtures of them, looking at the ratios. And by varying that ratio, you're varying the amount of that final product. In the report, you're looking at how many moles of each material is present in each one of your diluted test tubes, each one of those combinations. How many moles are present in, of each species and what is the mole fraction? You're then using that mole fraction and the measured absorbance of the resulting purple product to determine at what point is there that maximum stoichiometric ratio. Look at a graph of the absorbance on the y-axis versus mole fraction on the x-axis and determine at what point is there a peak in the data. Where is the point where the data is increasing in absorbance 
and then shifts to decreasing. At that point, that maximum amount, that is the stoichiometric ratio of the empirical formula. You're also looking at preparing a, a few different solutions of different sulfates. Everyone is preparing a solution of aluminum sulfate, which is colorless, as well as a solution of a different transition metal sulfate, either blue copper sulfate, red cobalt sulfate, or green nickel sulfate, and weighing out a specific mass using the mass and its molecular weight to determine how many moles of the different uh, compound you weighed out, using the ratio of the moles uh, of the compounds themselves. If you have one mole of nickel sulfate, how many moles of nickel ion would that be? How many moles of sulfate ion would that be? and dissolving that set amount in 50 milliliters of water. You'll have the moles, you have the volume, so you can determine the molarity of your two prepared solutions. You'll then take some amount of each of those solutions and combine them together. You're diluting each of those solutions in each other and determining what is the final concentration of all of the different ions that are present in that last solution. You'll then look at what is the absorbance of your three prepared solutions and determine a percent error of that particular measurement. You'll know the theoretical concentration of each one of those ions based on the mass and based on the volume of the material that you weighed out and the, the solutions that you've, you've measured and compare that to uh, the measured absorbance. So in the end you're looking at a lot of different solutions and hopefully throughout the lab you're getting a better sense of how to prepare different types of solutions and how to utilize them in chemistry.